The names Camaro and Firebird certainly have their place in automotive history, and for many years, the Camaros and Firebirds were not only great-looking vehicles, but overall great values in terms of performance cars. In some cases, though, they were made with rather cheap materials and were known for squeaks and rattles. But one thing that you could count on for the Camaro and Firebird was good looks. In 1982, the third-generation Camaro and Firebird were introduced with all new, much sportier styling than the 1981 models that they replaced. And there was quite a bit of excitement when both Chevrolet and Pontiac launched their vehicles in 1982. At the top of the line for the Camaro was the Z28, or if you're in Canada or some other countries, the Z28. It was certainly a great looking vehicle with exposed headlamps and hood scoops and an overall clean body shape. The Firebird was also another vehicle that was especially well styled and at least my personal favorite, the asymmetrical hood scoop that adorned some of the models. The Trans Am, as in previous years, was the top of the line Firebird. Though top of the line is certainly a relative term for not only the Camaro and Firebird, but let's just say most American vehicles of the era. This was a time, the so-called malaise era, in which many vehicles were way down on horsepower from previous generation vehicles, in part because of fuel economy regulations, the corporate average fuel economy standards, that had automakers marching toward a corporate fleet average fuel economy of 27.5 miles per gallon by the late 1980s. The other part of this malaise era was downsized engines, which were significantly down on power from the small and big block V8s that many customers were accustomed to in the 1960s and 1970s. By this time, as automakers were trying to meet corporate average fuel economy standards as well as emission standards, engine sizes were reduced and horsepower also went down at the same time. And perhaps one of the best examples of what happened to horsepower during this time period is this 1982 Camaro and Firebird, and in particular, the four-cylinder Camaro and Firebird that was offered from 1982 to 1986. Yes, I did not say that incorrectly. Four-cylinder Camaro and Firebird was offered from 1982 to 1986. Many of the viewers of this channel will think of V8-powered vehicles when they think of Camaros and Firebirds of this era. And unfortunately, the V8s were not that potent during this time frame. In fact, in 1982, the top V8 was a crossfire injected V8, 305 cubic inches, making 165 horsepower. That was all that you could get for the top horsepower in 1982. And better than that, you had to get it attached to a three speed turbo hydromatic 200 transmission. You could not get a manual transmission behind that Crossfire 305 V8 equipped Camaro or Firebird. And as I said, it was a turbo hydromatic 200 transmission, effectively a grenade behind your 305 cubic inch V8, as that transmission was originally developed for use in Chevettes and somehow made its way largely due to fuel economy standards and its reduced weight compared to turbo hydromatic 350s, 400s, behind this 305 cubic inch V8. It did get a little bit better for 1983 when the Crossfire V8 made 175 horsepower and horsepower started climbing a bit in the subsequent years with a high output 305 coming shortly thereafter making 190 horsepower. But let's focus a little bit on the four-cylinder Camaro and Firebird that were introduced in the 1982 model year. Both of these vehicles were powered by a Pontiac sourced 2.5 liter, 151 cubic inch, Iron Duke four-cylinder engine that made all of 90 horsepower in this application and really in any application, the Iron Duke four-cylinder was not a powerhouse. Over its lifetime, the Iron Duke made roughly 90 horsepower. There was some variance in 1984, it made 92 horsepower when a new cross-flow head was introduced. And in 1985, it made between 88 and 92 horsepower, the same for 1986. But in general, this Iron Duke four-cylinder was just something that was extremely pokey when it was under hood of the Firebird and Camaro, in part because the vehicles really were not all that light from a weight standpoint. 
Overall, the Firebirds and Camaros weighed almost 3,000 pounds, which for a sports car was not light at all. And that caused these Camaro and Firebirds, at least when equipped with the automatic transmission, to take about 17 to 18 seconds to go from zero to 60 miles an hour. 17 to 18 seconds for what was supposed to be a sports car or at least a sporty car. It's just absolutely absurd. In fact, the Camaro and Firebird were some of the heaviest vehicles that the Iron Duke would power if, if, of course, you exclude postal trucks and the Grumman LLV and vehicles like that. But under hood of the X cars, the Chevrolet Citations, Pontiac Phoenix, Oldsmobile Omega, and Buick Skylark, as well as the A bodies, the Oldsmobile Cutlass Sierra, Buick Century, Chevrolet Celebrity, Pontiac 6000, and even the N cars like the Olds Calais, the Buick Somerset, the Iron Duke was still not a powerhouse, but those vehicles weighed between 2,400 and typically about 27, 2,800 pounds. Of course, the Iron Duke was also the standard engine in the Fiero when the Fiero was introduced, but the Fiero weighed about 2,500 pounds, so significantly less than the Firebird. In any event, under hood, this Iron Duke was nothing but a slow poke. I guess one good thing was that it was fuel injected from the start as opposed to the X cars where it was carbureted in 1980 and 1981 form. So at least it started up with relative reliability and the engine was pretty durable from an overall operability standpoint. If you were so lucky as to select a manual transmission for your Iron Duke, you got a vehicle that would go from 0 to 60 in about 14 to 15 seconds as opposed to 17 to 18. So you were really hauling at that time period. It's unfortunate because aside from this Iron Duke powertrain, the Firebirds and the Camaros of the era were certainly great lookers, although their interior materials and fit and finish were quite deplorable, even by the standards of the time. Buyers were much better to opt for at least the 2.8 liter, 173 cubic inch V6 that made 105 horsepower in 1982. And as the years went on, it made a little bit more. And by 1986, the V6 was actually pretty good overall, making somewhere around 130 horsepower and having multi-port injection by that time as well as a year before in 1985. But for those who wanted a car that, as they would say in Texas, was all hat and no cattle, they could select a base four-cylinder Firebird and drive it around and at least look like they were driving something that was relatively sporty. Of course, I don't even think that you could do a burnout at all even with an open differential on these vehicles, perhaps if it were raining or if it were snowy or icy. That was about the only way that you were going to get a burnout out of an Iron Duke-powered Firebird. So what can you do to get a little extra power if, unfortunately, you own one of these vehicles? Well, I have quite a few suggestions, and none of them really work unless you want to spend a lot of money. There were some high-performance variants of Iron Dukes that were made in the aftermarket, but one thing that you can try to do is certainly advance the timing on your vehicle from the base setting. And this was actually a trick that I believe General Motors PR used when they would send cars out to be evaluated by the media. I've read a number of reports and even seen a number of videos, in particular Bob Mayer's evaluation of a 1980 Oldsmobile Omega. You can search for that on YouTube where reviewers commented on spark knock that they heard from under hood. And I suspect that what happened here is that GM's press fleet managers advanced the timing pretty significantly on these Iron Duke powered cars to make them feel more peppy than they really were in stock settings because these cars do actually respond to advances in engine timing very well. Of course, you don't want to advance the timing so much that you're hearing spark knock on a regular basis, but I've experienced with Iron Dukes, you can set them at about five or six degrees above base timing, and they do feel significantly peppier, and you'll even get better gas mileage. The reason why they didn't do that from the factory is that more advanced ignition timing creates higher combustion temperatures, which creates higher exhaust emissions. In any case, hope you enjoyed this spotlight on one of the worst sports cars of all time, the 1982 through 1986 Camaro and Firebird 
equipped with GM's 2.5 liter, 151 cubic inch Iron Duke four cylinder engine. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.